Well, welcome everyone. We are here to continue our conversations about the future of work. And nobody better for us to, to talk about uh, that topic than uh, Brian Wallace. So Brian, great to, that you could join us today. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for having me. I uh, will run through a little bit of uh, my background. I am a proud double graduate of the University of Arizona. I graduated with a, a BS in finance in 1988. I uh, was hired by uh, H. Ross Perot from Electronic Data Systems for my first job and actually interviewed on campus. So it was a, a, a great experience for me. I worked, uh, was trained in computer programming, which at the time I didn't even know how to type. So my my first job was to learn how to type and my second, which I had to do over the weekend. And then my second job was nine months of programming. I then was moved to uh, Germany in Frankfurt and worked on costing and pricing programs throughout Europe. So I would go around to the various offices and uh, it was a, a phenomenal experience. Um, I, I still don't know why a company allowed a 22, 23 year old kid to travel all over Europe and do those things, but it was uh, a lot of fun and I learned a lot. Um, and foundationally, just uh, working for someone like that in an organization, it wasn't always fun, but it really did form a great foundation of what I wanted to do and more importantly, what I didn't want to do. Um, so after, uh, after that experience, I returned to the US and uh, started law school at, also at the University of Arizona. I uh, attended on a uh, Senate scholarship uh, where I went uh, two years uh, to law school and then finished uh, working for Senator DeConcini from Arizona, who since retired, as, as you all know, um, in, uh, um, on the Senate Judiciary Committee um, in Washington, D.C. So after I finished that program, I returned back to Arizona uh, I moved to the Phoenix area and worked for a, uh, a large law firm uh, for a time. And, you know, at, at, at that time, I, I bounced around a little bit, trying to figure out really what I wanted to do uh, in the law, in business in general. Um, I uh, ended up, uh, I got married and we decided to relocate to Colorado. And I started work a technology practice uh, back in, this is kind of in the mid 90s and working with uh, startup companies and uh, financings and doing really light securities work um, and working uh, mainly in the venture capital industry. I did that for about eight or nine years and then moved gradually over the next three or four into direct investing and actually left a uh, lucrative law practice to the dismay of my wife and uh, started a uh, venture firm with my still partner. Um, and we did that in uh, 2004. Um, so I've been doing uh, direct investing uh, in uh, early stage venture capital ever since that time. So we, uh, the name of the firm is Access Venture Partners. I have two other partners. We invest throughout the Rocky Mountain region. We've done um, we're investing out of our fourth fund and we just closed our fifth fund. So we're, we're, uh, have had enough success to keep going. And, uh, and we're proud of the fact that we've invested in, uh, just over a hundred companies. We did our hundredth deal this year. Um, we've had, uh, a lot of, uh, interesting, uh, ups and downs along the way and a lot of, uh, several successful companies and IPOs and, and the like. Um, so, it's been a, um, a really fun transition and uh, um, it's just a, it's a, it's a great fun way to make a living. And uh, um, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything else I'd rather do. Um, and it's, it's also a privilege to uh, be able to do things like this, to uh, get re-engaged with uh, the University of Arizona, which is uh, just such an important part of, of how I got here um, as a third generation Arizona grad, my grandfather, uh, rode a horse at Old Main, so to put it in perspective. And now my uh, youngest daughter will be a freshman in the fall. So the, uh, the legacy continues, so we're excited about that. 
Well, that, that, that's an amazing life, an amazing career. And I appreciate the fact that you're, you're giving back, you're, you're connecting to us. And uh, that's the, the wildcat uh, spirit. And uh, so uh, when, when I was listening to, to your trajectory, a couple of things uh, come to mind, which I think our students and our friends uh, that are going to be listening to this would appreciate. Uh, the, the, you have the, this amazing career that spans the corporate world. Uh, you did, uh, you tried different things. You probably uh, challenged your comfort zone several times. Uh, you came back to, 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 to school. You decided to, to shift uh, in, in, in another direction. So I think that the learning is uh, life is about this, right? It's about uh, taking opportunities and, and, and be open to, ch to changes. And uh, many students think that they're going to be doing one thing for the rest of their lives. And I think uh, you're a great example. That's, that's not how it works, right? You have to, to be open-minded and uh, evaluate the opportunities as, as, as they come about. Yeah, I, I think that's right. The way I've always approached is, is not to be with my head up looking to move, but it's just to be prepared and to work hard with what you're doing. And, you know, you just gravitate towards what you like and what makes you content. And it's not that work is, you know, it's still, they call it work for a reason because it's work, but as long as you're doing something that is ultimately rewarding and it just took me, you know, a while to find that. And I just was, wasn't willing to settle. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm also entrepreneurial. So taking risk is part of that. Uh, but I, but I think it's that balance between work and personal life that's always been really important to me. Uh, and, and, and I think also part of it is I like to work. I, I really like what I do and I'm not, yeah. uh, I don't shy away from, you know, putting in the time to be better at my craft. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you are now an investor venture capitalist uh, kind of looking for opportunities you, you, you concentrate on early stage uh, tech companies so i mean the, going back to our theme of today's conversation the future work i guess you, you're evaluating opportunities that are about uh, creating the future of work right so i wanted you to to kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, i mean the, how you see work itself evolving uh, the workforce and the, the workplace and how those things uh, come together and how they're going to evolve in the future. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's amazing how an event like COVID and the shutdown of the economy can really, it, I, I don't know if it's much fundamentally changed. I think what it did is accelerate the changes that were already in place. And what the theme that we've really seen in our investing is you know when I started my career, it was it was really top down management. You know you got your job, you were felt lucky to have, have your job. You got a lapel pen of whatever company you worked at, and you put on your suit every day, and you went and did your, your job, and and you were as directed. And there wasn't much uh, thought or you know creativity or freedom in that role when you started in, you know, what was largely corporate America. Um, you know, today, you know, the entrepreneurial, you know, through technology and the evolution, you know, which started in Silicon Valley and now persists across the country, it's really democratized the workforce. So in our companies in particular, you, we can't even adopt software unless you get buy-in with the people that are going to use it. And, you know, it's, it seems like a subtle change, but it really is dramatic in that it's no longer, you're gonna use these tools to do your job. It's more of the worker saying, I need these tools to do my job better. So you support me in that. So it's really having to shift the focus. And, you know, and so when I think of workers, you really have to be cognizant of how workers wanna work, and what tools they need to be successful, and just as important, how they don't want to work. Uh, and so it's a real balance right now between the workplace 
which is one area and, and does the workplace still exist? And, and you know, as I uh, said in the article that I put, you know, wrote for Eller is it, it absolutely matters a lot. I think it matters even more so um, because especially for the young workers starting out, you can't learn on Zoom. You can't learn from being in video conferences. You can't learn through email. You need to be there. You need to really observe and, and you need to socialization aspect to really grow your culture of your company. So I, I think what we've seen is just this evolution to, again, the democratization of the workforce and then struggling now, how do we balance providing the freedom for employees to work wherever they want with the need to build a corporate culture in you know, the workplace? And in doing that, it, you know, how do you find the right workers to build your workforce? It's a, it's, it's a real delicate act. Yeah, I, I think you're touching a, a great point here. Uh, you mentioned uh, going from top-down hierarchical structure to this democratized uh, workforce approach where you're enhancing creativity and freedom. And uh, you also mentioned the, the culture, right? The corporations, organizations, that they have their own identity, their own culture. And, and how do you see that that team that changing? I mean, that the, the, that tension between the flexibility, creativity, and preserving some kind of culture, or is the culture definition changing? Yeah, I think that I don't think the culture definition is changing. I think how you build the culture is changing, and and still the best companies in the world are always places where people want to work, where they're proud. And they're proud of not necessarily, but everything that they do, because a lot of the tasks to make a company successful, you know, you have to have, a, you know, business development folks doing cold calls. You know, you, that's not fun. You have to do a lot of things that, that uh, improve sales productivity. A lot of those things are, are, you know, just task oriented and not, you know, rewarding activities. But so you have to build a greater good of we're all doing this for a common purpose and and a reward system that acknowledges that. And, you know, it's the, the biggest shift that I've seen in, in, in the last five years is rewards in money and stock. While they're always important, they're less important than flexibility. I want to work Monday through Thursday and I want Fridays. On. I want to be recognized by my peers and I want you to send me on a vacation to Hawaii. I want, you know, to be able to lead a group outside of work in, you know, some other aspirational thing that I have. And, and, and so all of those, those things you have to think about how you reward your employees and how you recognize your employees. And then we've made several investments in that area that really pushes that from the manager level down to the peer level so that, you know, you can really listen to the employee and make sure that you're doing the things that they want you to do while keeping them doing the job that you need them to do. So, that you, you know, you make money. You can't forget, I, you know, I say this at board meetings all the time. Like, yeah, we want to treat people as well and how they want to be treated, but our primary directive here is still to be profitable. Yeah. I mean, for a while, a few years ago, when uh, these, uh, kind of a two-sided platform uh, businesses, the, the, the ride share companies, the, the, the Airbnb companies, right? A lot, a lot of talk about uh, the gig economy. You just, uh, you hire people for their services, you pay them and, and that's it. But I, I think the evolution has been more about uh, the financial compensation is only one aspect of that. And you talked about, uh, about purpose, you talked about enjoying working for the company. So uh, when you're evaluating these uh, uh, ideas and these uh, early stage uh, companies, how do you measure that component of, uh, of purpose or, or uh, people wanting to work there, that they, 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 they enjoying the work kind of, a, kind of a dimension? Is that something that uh, venture capitalists look at when, when evaluating uh, uh, the, those types of ventures? Yeah, at the real early stage, it's such a small team 
Yeah. And and at that at that level, you're really looking for passion for the product. So to make sure that the early stage the product driven team really believes in what they're doing and believes in it for the right reason. And it's it's really challenging to assess because you know entrepreneurs by nature are aggressive and you know driven and they convince you that what they're doing is the most important thing in the world but you know you have to be able to spend the time and understand and then you have to look at how they built their initial team and is it people they've never worked with before is it are, you know is it a team comprised of people who came out of an organization or pulled people from different relationships and just as importantly what have they given up to go chase this opportunity. So opportunity cost matters a lot. And that's how we, you know, some, some things that over time, pattern recognition, we try to assess, you know, are, is the team together for the right purpose that they believe in? And as the, as the team assembled based upon personal relationships that are deeper than, hey, I think this guy or this gal is really smart. I want to go work with them. It's, I'm going to go into battle. I, I hate to use war analogies, but you know, I'm going to give up what is a lucrative career here or a big opportunity because I believe in this person and I believe in the other people on this team. And it, does that exist? Does the passion in the what they're doing and who they're doing it with exist? And generally, when you have both of those, they will start to build the right culture and attract people that are on that same wavelength that, that want those same things. Uh, that, that's very interesting. Passion, purpose, and to, to trying to assess that uh, even at that early stage. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that you wrote in, in the article, which is how different technologies like AI and uh, and virtual reality. How do you see those changing the nature of work? Yeah. I, I... It's going to be a dramatic and rapid change into not necessarily how people work, but what tasks people do, and more importantly, what tasks people don't do any longer. So, you know, the, the stage of artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, you know, they're big words, they're big ideas, but even the companies that are doing groundbreaking uh, work with business applications, the, the first wave that we're seeing now actually make workers do less of what the uh, ordinary and just repetitive tasks are. So as an example, uh, if we were on this call and it was a sales call uh, and I'm selling you on a product, I would, after we get off this call, I would have to enter my notes and records into a CRM system and move you from an opportunity to, you know, further down the pipeline as an example of a typical situation. The, the AI and, and machine learning tools now are listening and they will say, oh, you know, that this needs to move. I'm going to automatically update that record in Salesforce. I'm going to pull up a Slack or a Microsoft Teams to bring in a sales engineer because we're at that stage and let's get this scheduled in the follow-up meeting. So, those are all things that are that are you know have to be done, but they can they don't need to be done, so it'll save the time. So then I can move on to the next opportunity to close more business, and I'm not using that time to do administrative tasks. So that's kind of the way that we see the early productivity tools coming that will will perform things that we used to have to all do or someone had to do. Uh, the where we're a long way is actually being able to move through. And I, I think the best example of this are the chat bots that you see when you go to websites and they're pretty good at saying, answering a few basic questions, but they get so frustrating because they can't really engage with you. And, and so that's where I think the, the next innovations are really with the artificial intelligence, which has become more conversational and to understand more or emotive uh, uh, concepts, and they're just not there yet, but uh, they're, they're coming. Yeah, so I think it's going to, to go from a, this increasing automation to more smart automation and uh, taking advantage of the, the artificial intelligence and, and machine learning 
in, in a real way, right? Not just uh, routine automation. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing to see it. And we have an early stage investment uh, in a company called Hyperia, and they have a listening tool that does a lot of these things that I just talked about. And it really changes the way when you start using this tool that you're communicating to other people, but then you have to think about the right way to say things so that your artificial intelligence that's listening to you will do things and record things the right way. So it's, it's almost like a Star Trek episode where you're talking to the person and then you're talking to the computer. Uh, and that'll get better over time, but it, that's really how it's changing work behavior now is to be able to interact with both humans for you know, higher level intellectual pursuits and communication and then lower level just, you know, wrote tasks that the, that the uh, machine can do for you. Yeah. We, we in, in academia, we are engaging in these discussions and a lot of thinking about uh, how do, all of those things we're talking about will change the way we educate uh, future professionals. We are very good at uh, kind of uh, delivering uh, skills, having uh, students learn specific technical skills or in accounting or finance or, or, or IT. And uh, as this uh, work changes, right, and uh, the future work uh, is coming with different perspectives, how do you see that this, this whole notion of skills and evolution of skills or what do, do people need to, to, to do to, to stay current? Yeah, I, uh, I've thought a lot about this over the last few weeks and I thought about my own career. And you know, when I graduated from Arizona, we didn't even have spreadsheet programs. The early version of Lotus 1, 2, 3 was out and it was really hard to use. Um, you know, now Microsoft itself, you know, anyone can use it, um, you know, from, and, and so that is something that is a tool that can be taught, um, but, and I think colleges and, and universities need to continue to evolve in, in teaching the technical skills on how to do things and how to leverage systems to make you more productive. But I think the most important thing Getting back to our, you know, question before, how do we assess, you know, management teams in our job? And I think it's the durable skills that where universities will continue to shine. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about, you know, technical schools and programming schools will take over and, and really provide the tools that the workforce needs, but they ignore the durable skills and leadership and communication and, uh, you know, intellectual honesty and, and mindfulness and, you know, and, you know, being a dynamic person and those durable skills, you know, and I, I look back at my career and I was lucky enough to have, you know, some mentors along the way who stressed that it was way more important to be a leader than it was to be necessarily the best at doing a particular task. And I remember an early speech from, you know, Ross Perot, which has said, you know, he said, I, I can't replace leaders, but I can replace workers. So if all you are is a worker, then you should leave now because you'll probably get fired. Um, he was a little direct that way. But he said, if you become a leader and people look up to you and you can drive results on a team, then you're irreplaceable for any organization. And, and so I think that we need to refocus less on skills on how to get jobs done and more on the durable skills. And the more young people learn that, the more successful they'll be because they'll, they'll thrive in organizations and you know, be able to learn what they want to do and how to do it. Uh, I think that, that that's a great point that that really resonates uh, with uh, what we're doing. And uh, I think that the way to to start the presenting and, and exposing our students and getting them acquire these durable skills. Some people call them the, the human capabilities. Uh, it's more through uh, what we call experiential learning, the learning by doing, setting up uh, projects, teams, uh, and really having students just uh, go at that, at that and uh, to, to try to use the skills and the concept, but developing these, these uh, 
soft skills and durable skills. So, and that 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 has been a transformation, uh, in my opinion, in, in higher education, so to try to get more of the, that component uh, to, to the classroom and, and beyond the classroom. Yeah, and I, I think that's where universities are uniquely set up to thrive in that education, as opposed and and you know you look at the U.S. education system from you know broad-based universities like the University of Arizona down to you know, small liberal arts schools. And, and the one thing that, that we consistently provide is versus the world is education with durable skills. And, and I think that's overlooked and uh, in, in discussions. And I'm really glad that there seems to be more of a focus on that because that's, that's truly how you become really good at what you do um, and, and really understand why you're doing it and, and can actually make great things happen as with those skills. Yeah, and that would lead to, to really think about the, the larger purpose, uh, how you connect the dots, uh, uh, the, the creativity that, that uh, you talked about earlier, right? The creativity and, and, and uh, utilizing the, the, those concepts. So I, I think in a higher education institution, we have to really continuously focus more and more on those. And uh, one way of doing that is to partner with our alumni and get uh, them to come back like you, you are doing here, right? And, uh, and help us uh, kind of uh, design uh, the, 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 the experience that will lead to, to, to those goals. Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, you know, the training and here's how to do something coupled with why do you do something and, and who do you do it with? And, and you know, those, it, it's hard to do in an academic setting, but I, I think it just needs to be, you know, cross disciplines of, you know, engineers taking business classes and business students taking some, you know, technical classes and all of them taking a philosophy class or, a, you know, a, an English literature class or, or the yeah. like that yeah. uh, should always be required. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So it's been a, a, a great conversation. Uh, I think uh, you are the perfect person to, to be talking about uh, all these issues from, from your, your own career experience and also from your current uh, position, what you do, you're always looking forward, right? Uh, looking at uh, what is next. So I really appreciate your sharing your, your thoughts and ideas. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much, Brian. All right. Thanks.